How many in total payouts do you have? Like more than 45. <laughs> Monetary wise, how much? Nearly 200K now. 200K, still in uni. Amazing. Uh, did you do any scaling with any of the firms? Uh, my Forex funds, I had 700K with them, which I lost. How did that impact you? As soon as I saw that, I, was, I bought 1 million challenges and just started running them. To be honest, when I actually started the entrepreneurship journey, literally since day one, the goal I told everyone was, I want to make 500K a month. How are you maintaining the obsession? How do you maintain the focus on that? Like, I need 500K a month. Until mm -hmm. I don't have it, I'm not going to be happy. Why do you need 500? In this episode of The Weight of the CPT, we have Armand Sanga. He is a 20-year-old trader who is currently managing over 1 million in prop firm capital. Over the last year, he has proven consistency by being one of the few traders to hold a prop firm account for over one year and get over 60 payouts across several prop firms. With over 100K in payouts before graduating from the university, Armand will share how he gets consistent payouts trading NAS 100, how he plans to hit his goal of 500K per month and his approach to prop firm challenges. Without further ado, Let's talk to Armand. Before we get started with the podcast, I'd like to talk to you about Funded Next. Funded Next is a disruptor in the prop industry with two unique offerings. Number one, they're the only prop firm in the industry that pays traders 15% of their challenge profits. Traders generally don't like trading during the challenge phase because they don't actually earn any money. Funded Next has addressed traders' concerns by allowing them to earn money during the challenge. On average, traders earn two to three times the challenge fee when they successfully pass and get their first payout. For example, the cost of a 50K account is around 299 and the 15% profit split from passing the challenge is 975. It's a one to three ROI, not including the profits earned from the simulated funded account. Number two, they promise that traders will receive payouts within 24 hours from the request or they will give them $1,000. This is a bold guarantee and sets them apart from many firms. Funded Next is one of the few prop firms that provides balance-based drawdown and they emphasize that their trading conditions are amongst the best due to them owning dedicated servers for MT4 and MT5. They pride themselves on providing raw spreads and the lowest commissions in the prop firm industry. Industry. They also are expected to release an integration with TradingView in December in which traders will be able to execute trades and do their charting directly from the Funded Next dashboard. If you want to take a challenge with a company that is disrupting the industry and creating opportunity globally, diversify or scale your prop firm accounts to new levels, get access to your account within seconds and 10% off by clicking the link in the description. Welcome to another podcast with the way of the CP. PT. We are in the UK with Armand Sanga. He is one of the youngest prop traders and he has a lot of uh, great achievements that we'll talk about today. But one of the things that I want to mention, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a book reader and there's a, there's a quote from Market Wizards from Paul Tudor Jones, one of the uh, most renowned traders um, out there. Don't focus on making money, focus on protecting what you have. So I think about this quote when I think about Armand because he is one of the, uh, not only one of the youngest traders, but he is one of the only traders that have held an account for a very long time. I think it's been a year yeah. or so, right? Yeah, so um, I'm really excited about this pod. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, bro. Yeah, um, so normally what I like to do is I ask um, people to go into their childhood, right? I wanna get to know like how Armand grew up, what shaped you and how you got to the point to where you are now. So just talk a little bit about where you were from, your family and uh, just your childhood a little bit. Yeah, so my family is from uh, India, a place called Punjab. They moved to Italy uh, before I was born uh, because my dad like wanted, you know how they want to move out from like Asian countries for better job opportunities and stuff like that. So they moved uh, to Italy, and that's where I was born. And my dad used to work as a farmer there. And uh, it was actually like a really tough job because I would literally see him work like the whole day. He would leave like 4 a.m. and then come back at like 8 p.m just working in a farm. At that time, obviously I didn't understand it like that much. It was like a difficult job or not. So we kept like changing houses and everything because he would get fired from one place, then would go to a different farm, right? And uh, yeah, then from there, about six years ago, we moved uh, to the UK. And the main reason for that was because my parents saw it's better opportunity here for their kids because it's better education here than in Italy. And uh, that's when I was like, uh, 
I started, like, that's when I started realizing that they actually, it's a big struggle, right? They have to go through. And I was like, money is really important. And that's when I started focusing on the whole like self-improvement and entrepreneur like uh, side of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, that being money conscious, right? Because of the struggles of your, your parents, um, that's what made you interested in making money. How early like did you start thinking about making money? Around 16. Mm, around yeah. 16, okay. That's when it like hit me. I just woke up one day, I was like, damn, if I had like, let's say a million dollars, a lot of the problems would be solved, right? Mm, okay. That's so 16 years old. Um, what did you start doing to try to make money at that time? Well, at that time, the first thing I did was like, you know, search on Google, like on YouTube, like how to make money online, all these things. Uh, I thought it was the easy way, right? You can make some extra money or not and help your parents. But it wasn't like that. Like slowly came to the conclusion that it's, you have to be serious about it. It's like a full-time thing. It's like your career, the whole entrepreneurship journey, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it began with me like uh, coming across crypto. Obviously, the first thing that took my eye was like um, huge pumps, like you can make 100x your money, 1000x your money. So I'm excited for that. But then I realized that's like no good idea either. It's not going to work. It's like pretty much gambling at that point. And then from there. How did you realize that, though? Like, did you start? Did you, did you try it out or you just I, thought through it? I did try it out. I actually bought, asked my parents for like 100 pounds here. And I was like, trust me, I'm actually going to make money today. And then still this day, the 100 is gone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then from there, what what, what did you do? Uh, from there, I was like, let me see if uh, I came, like then I found out about day trading crypto. I was like, yeah, you can, you can actually day trade and make money like every day from it. I, that's when I saw the charts and everything, price action. I was like, this is interesting. So I looking into that more. But then at one point, uh, I was like, maybe crypto is not it because I was researching so much into like day trading. I was seeing more like uh, information online about day trading, like Forex, uh, uh, indices, these things. So that's why I started looking into that then. I did that for a few months. I was back testing, but I was like back testing pretty much uh, these strategies they see online, right? Like 99% mm -hmm. win rate, all these crazy things on YouTube. I back tested them a lot. And then the conclusion I came to back then was that it's a scam. Like the market moves literally the opposite way of where you place the trade. Yeah. So I was, I was like, I'm not gonna do this. Let's find a different business. Then I went into e-com. Uh, so I started doing like uh, drop shipping. I tried that. So about this time, I, it was around, I had just finished A-levels in the UK. So it was about, uh, I just started university. Okay. And the thing with university is here, they give you this thing called maintenance loan, which is uh, money they give to like low income households so that I can buy, for example, a laptop, books, or accommodation at uni, right? Mm -hmm. So they gave me like, I think, five or six K for a year. And I was using that literally for these businesses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did the same thing. So, okay, let's go back a little bit. So yeah. at 16, you started actually trading Forex, yeah. like CFDs, like MT5, yeah, you downloaded MT5. Mm -hmm. You were learning from YouTube and you were back testing these strategies. Like what were you, how, when you say you were back testing strategies, what were you actually doing? It was just random, right? You go on the chart, like no actual plan behind how you're gonna collect the data or anything. You just keep going back, placing trades whenever, like, I don't know, you see an EMA crossover or something. Yeah. You place a trade. You don't care about the risk to reward. You try to aim the whole move. It, it was just all over the place. So you were live trading at the time. You, no. borrowed, you borrowed more money or you were, doing, you were demo trading? This was all demo, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, all mm -hmm. demo. All right. So you went from there. You thought it was a scam. Went into drop shipping. Yeah. And you, were, you went into the university. So what age did you go into the uni? Um... Just about when I turned 18. Okay, just yeah. about 18. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So drop shipping in, in uni. Yeah. You're using the, the, the your loan from yeah. uni. <laughs> I actually made some money with drop shipping for like a few weeks and then I ended up losing like all of it. I went all in. I was like, damn, this is really good. L let me scale the store. Like I had the store, I was selling some uh, AirPods cleaning tool and uh it was quite profitable at the start. I was making like 20 pounds a day. <laughs> and I was like, that was really good as a student, right? Yeah. But then at the end, when I did the whole calculation with the margins and everything, I was like so negative. It was crazy. I lost like 2,000 pounds with that. So you had inventory that didn't sell. Yeah, inventory didn't sell. And then I bought like crazy subscriptions. Uh, I bought like yearly plans, right, to save money. <laughs> <laughs> you were all in. I'm like, I'm buying these yeah. yearly plans. Okay. So... Those all wasted, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Now, so from there, how did you actually transition into trading? Well, before I actually back, went back to trading, into trading, 
I, after dropshipping, I went into another business, Amazon FBA. Mm-hmm. I was like, maybe this is the one. I did that as well. There I ended up losing another like 1.5K. Mm. So that completely failed. Like literally at that point, I was ordering like big stock at home because you need to send it to Amazon, right? You package it at home, put your QR codes and stuff on there and send it to Amazon. So literally for like a month, I was having like big um, box of cat food, <laughs> random products show up at home, yeah? My parents are like, what are you doing? Like 50 shampoo bottles come in. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so did you have anybody mentoring you at the time or you were just- Just me. <laughs> just you, just trying things out. Mm-hmm. Okay, but you had the drive because of the struggles you saw your parents go through. Yeah, I was like, I want to make money no matter what. <laughs> no matter what, yeah. right? Get rich or die trying. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so you had, the, you had the cat food and then how did you get back to the Forex from there? From there, and I was on Instagram one day and I came across an FTMO ad. And I was like, this looks interesting. If I can actually get that big amount of money, right? Like my whole perception in one second has changed. I was like, imagine making 0.5% on that. Mm -hmm. That's big money right there, right? Yeah. So from there, I started looking into the website of FTMO. I saw the free trial. I did that for a bit. Uh, And at that point, I still didn't know much about like how I should approach trading, right? But I think just knowing about the pro firms changed my approach to trading because now I just had like this framework I could adapt to where I knew what the target percentage is and I knew what the problem is at that point. Mm-hmm. I had to just find a way around it yeah. instead of just being in the, in the complete open on the charts without anything, right? Yeah. yeah. So I feel like the pro firm, just the rules guided me into making a system that was profitable pretty much. Yeah. So what were you studying in at the university at this time? Computer science. Computer science. Yeah, I did the same. Yeah. Last year right now, I'm studying university. Oh yeah, this is your last year, you're yeah. a senior. Wow, so you haven't graduated yet. Nah. Man, this is amazing. So you, so the guests have like some some really good things to come in store um, during this conversation because we're gonna talk about your payouts and how you've made how much money you've already made before graduating college, um, before graduating uni. That's that's really good, right? It's gonna come. But all right, so let's talk about like, um, so how are you learning? Like once you went back, you learned FTMO, when it comes to developing a strategy, right? How are you doing that? Were you just learning on your own? Did you have a mentor? Uh, pretty much on my own. I spent like five months and uh, was spending literally the whole day, like 10 hours. So you're spending 10 hours a day? Yeah, so I started spending 10 hours a day on the charts. I was like, the only way to figure it out is by actually learning what's going on the charts. I picked one symbol and I would literally wake up, start testing stuff on it for the whole day, go back to sleep, wake up again on the charts. The whole day, I was literally doing nothing. My parents were like, what are you doing, right? They were like, I'm wasting time. They were like, you're staring at some random colorful sticks on your screen the whole day, right? <laughs> yeah. And so at some point that does make you angry as well because you know you're actually doing it for the greater good, yeah. but they have no idea like the potential behind it. Yeah. And then I didn't know either if I'm actually gonna be able to do it, Yeah. but just kept trying. And so. It yep. was the promise of what you could make that kept you going, mm-hmm. right? So when you're balancing uni and trading, did you reach any point where you thought about quitting uni? I hear some people, they drop out. What kept you going? Uh, what kept you in uni? To be honest, uh, the only time I thought about dropping out uni was when I had already made quite a lot of money. Ah, <laughs> yeah. okay. <laughs> By that point, still, my parents were like, just I only had like one year left at that point, like one and a half years, right? So my parents would just do it, right? Finish it for them. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So you were doing a demo with FTMO mm-hmm. and then you did like free trials with yeah, FTMO. I did the free trials and um, me spending all those times on the chart. It took me about like four months of doing that yeah. every single day without breaks. And I actually found, I managed to come up with a system without an edge. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how did you learn about these concepts of edge and systems? For me, for example, I came from an engineering background. I graduated uh, with a degree in computer science and I worked in the engineering field for about like 12 years, right? Then I got into trading (laughs) and I read a lot of books. I had a lot of education. So uh, the terminology, like the domain terminology about playbooks, risk management, mindset, execution, all that stuff came from the books that I was reading as well as like the education that I received, right? So how did you learn about these concepts of having a playbook, having setups, having a system? How did you piece all of that together? I actually never read like a trading book ever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think um, the main uh, like knowledge that I was absorbing while I was 
like back testing and everything was every single interview available that online at that time. Mm, interviews, so I was yeah. watching every single interview with every single pro firm mm -hmm. that I could find because those people were the people I wanted to be like, right? Be in these interviews with these payouts. So I was like, let me watch them, what they're doing. So I watched every single one of them, all the FTO ones, all of them. Yeah. So who, which one of those really stuck out to you and impacted you, if you can remember? I don't think there was a specific one, to be honest. Yeah, or yeah. what did you actually get out of those interviews like that really helped uh, help you be as successful as you are now? Mm. Not too sure, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. All right, so um, four years in demo. I mean, four, <laughs> four months in demo, mm -hmm. okay? And what were you trading? A NASDAQ. NASDAQ. What stock, why, why NASDAQ? So I tried, I tried Forex first, right? But somehow it's like a gut feeling the Forex just wasn't the one. It's like, it felt like it's too many pairs and they're also similar, that's just how I looked at it. I was like, I need something that's a bit unique and it just moves its own way, right? Yeah. And uh, I, then I started looking into indices, I found out about US 30, S&P 500, and this made more sense to me, like it's a combination of all the uh, tech stocks and all that stuff, right? It's like, this is what I wanna look into. And I started trading US 30, S&P 500. I found that S&P SMP to be super slow. Yeah. I couldn't trade that. <laughs> yeah. And the US 30 was much faster. Like I couldn't trade that either that well. Then the NASDAQ was like the balance between the two. Yeah. And uh, I just stuck with that. Yeah, so you computer science major and you actually trade the NASDAQ, which is made of the tech stocks. Yeah. So so you you think you had an affinity towards NASDAQ because of that? Uh, maybe. I mean, I don't really like computer science that much, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you go into computer science? Because it's like the highest paying field, right? Yeah. Money is what matters at the end of the day. So yeah. if it was hard, I'm still going to do it. Yeah. If it was hard, you still do it. Yeah. That's, that's an important um, key for the audience. Okay, so now, um, how did you know that your system was ready for you to take a challenge? So I had back tested, I think, about six months of data at that point. And the main metrics I was looking at was um, in a month, the how much profit I was able to generate and my max drawdown. Okay. And uh, then I would, was able to just use simple ratio to like, if I double my risk, what percentage can I make and what's my potential risk, right? Yeah. And then I took a challenge and just use that. So till this day, you still didn't, you still didn't have any mentors. No, I, ne I never got any like mentorship or any signal groups, any like that. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. I always thought they were scams to me. Yeah. Like yeah. even though I do think there is good uh, courses that you can actually that can speed up your learning, right? Yeah. They might be able to like uh, prevent you from going into the whole uh, rabbit hole of looking at these ninety nine percent strategy or not. But to me, it always seemed like a scam. Yeah. So till this point. You didn't spend any time with a personal account after mm -hmm. that first 100 pounds you blew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I see a parallel here with like successful prop traders in traditional um, backgrounds. So they actually go work for a prop firm and the prop firm provides the structure like risk management parameters, um, amount of, you know, amount, amount of trades you can take, those types of parameters. So it seems like FTMO actually provided that for you. And then you you figured out how to survive within the framework, right? Yep. Within those parameters, um, so that's that's pretty genius. And then it seems like you you actually avoided the whole flipping account uh, cycle that people get into, like um, trying to flip accounts, make a lot of money and then lose it. Yeah, I definitely did come across that point as well. Like okay. that you can flip accounts, right? But it, it, I just couldn't understand it. It seemed like too hard. It seemed impossible, literally mm. borderline impossible. I was like. Because I did, I'm like very mathematical about trading, right? Yeah. Uh, look at the probabilities and all that stuff. So every time I try, try these calculations, it just wouldn't make sense why I would want to do that. Yeah. Because the probability of you like flipping small amount to such a big amount is so low. It might take you a thousand tries before you even get it. Yeah. By the time you get it, because you tried so many times, you're close to break even already. Yeah. So you're better off finding like a small risk reward, normal strategy and just trading down a bigger size to pretty much do the same thing as flipping an account. Okay, so tell me about your system when it comes to probabilities. Tell me about like the risk to reward, the uh, win rate. So <clears throat> the current average win rate, it's a uh, 65% and it's a one-to-one -one risk to reward. But after slippage spreads, that comes down to about 0 0.85. Okay, mm -hmm. and you pass your challenges with that, yeah. those numbers. 
So my first ever challenge uh, is very like, let's go back there, very right. So my first ever challenge was on my Forex Funds 300K challenge. So I've never bought a challenge more than 300K. Really? Yeah, my first one was 300K right off. I was going to go all in <laughs> again. <laughs> again. So why do you think you have that personality of going all in? I mean, at that point, right now, I'm a bit more conservative. But back then, I really didn't have much to lose. Yeah. I just wanted to make it big, right? Yeah. So the only way to make it big is by going big. Yeah. If I bought a 50K account, sure, I might have made 100, 200. It would have been as big. Yeah. So, so was it a little bit of um, being naive at the point of like what you could lose? Or was it just you were driven by seeing your parents struggle? It could be the drive as well, but I don't think I was naive. Like I knew uh, how much money I have, right? If I lose it, how badly I'm going to be down and everything. Mm -hmm. So so if I bought the 300K and they're failing the first 300K. That was the only challenge I ever failed, mm. the first one. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so I failed the 300K and the reason wasn't even like trading related. I placed the trade and I went outside with my friends to play like basketball. And then I was like, okay, let me manage this trade. So I went on my phone and I started managing that trade remotely. So I was remotely controlling my desktop PC mm -hmm. and um, I started like remotely controlling the trade, but I entered by mistake a high lot size trade in there. Oh, and that yeah. like price just flew right there yeah. and it just breached my account. So what did you learn from that? To trade in my setup and then just <laughs> leave the trade alone. Like don't ever touch it. That's literally how I do it now. Uh, I place a trade and I leave it. Did I'm not on the charts again. Do you trade from your phone or from your computer. laptop? Do you have a rule of we well, don't trade from your phone? Uh, yeah, I don't like trading my phone. Yeah. You can just type something in wrong. Uh, it's like um, if you trade on your phone for like many, many months, right? Then you're probably fine. But because I had been on my computer the whole time, now suddenly changing that, it's bad. It's no, you're not going to be as comfortable, right? Yeah. Okay. So how did you learn about th thinking through your system in regards to probabilities. Because you talk about probabilities, you didn't have any formal training. How did you, like, you watch a lot of YouTube videos and interviews, like, how were you thinking about probabilities at the, the time when you, like, did your first 300K challenge? Uh, I mean, at that point, I had my data that I had collected, right? So my back test data, and uh, I had, I think, like a few weeks of uh, forward test on uh, FTMO demo. So I was like, uh, all I need to do now is just stick with the same rules that I followed through the back test and the forward test. Mm -hmm. And if I can do that and the probabilities are even slightly like, they can be a little bit different, right? But if they stay the same consistently, I should be eventually able to pass a challenge. Yeah, That's how I looked at it. It was just a matter of letting the probabilities like run for long enough. That's what, how I looked at it. Yeah. So is, this, is that probability uh, thinking, is that what helped you work through losses? At mm -hmm. the time, I think a, a lot of people have the challenge. They have an issue with trading through losses. But how did you deal with trading through losses? Yeah, I think probability is literally the answer. Like every time now, even on Twitter, someone's like asking me, right, about these questions, like how are you dealing with losses? I'm like, there's no difference between when you're winning or you're losing. It's the same thing. Place the trade, leave. Come back again, place the trade. Eventually, if your system has an edge, you'll be back into profit. Yeah, there's yeah. There's no way to like be looking at the when you're in losses in a different way. Excellent, excellent. How do you manage your trades? So another thing I managed to like kind of solve a big problem for traders is a psychology problem, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was trading and uh, doing my whole like trial and error every day for tens of hours, I was like, psychology is a big issue. Like you can easily have a f the fear of missing out the trade, come in late, revenge trade. So I was like, how can I remove that? And I found out that if you, instead of placing a market order, you place a pending order, you pretty much remove that. Yeah. Now all emotions are gone. It's more mechanical. Yeah, you stick to your rules, place your order, you can literally close the chart, come back in 24 hours and see if that trade's hit. That's wow. what I did. So wow. now all my trades are stop orders. I do my analysis. I'm like, okay, if, if price comes here and it bounces off to my TP, that's my analysis, done, orders placed and I leave. Ah, I love it. I yep. love it. So I, I have four pillars that I talk about. Playbook, risk management, psychology, like mindset and execution, right? So you're building your playbook and you found a system and you gathered data in order to 
um, build a relationship with that system. You knew the exact data, the expected value, right? Um, the risk management side, right? How did you develop your risk management um, plan? Well, risk management, I always uh, had it at uh, 1% risk per trade. That was like, every time I was testing, I was like, I need good results with 1% risk per trade. And then from there, I can change it based on what results I have. So if my monthly return is too low, then I can increase my risk, right? Instead of 1%, it could be 2%, but then I need to also see my max drawdown. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And I just had to find a balance between that. Okay. So do you keep the risk consistent most of the time? So on my challenges, I'm now risking 2% per trade. And uh, on my fund accounts, I'm risking 1% per trade. But if I hit 5% drawdown, then I would uh, reduce my risk. So pretty much the closer I get to the max uh, limit, it's uh, the smaller my risk gets. So it's pretty much like the infinity line. It never approaches the actual breaching limit, right? Yeah. Because risk keeps getting smaller, and the only way from there is just recovering it slowly. Okay. So you mentioned to me that you went into drawdown on your first 300K funded account, right? Did you invent the system of uh, reducing the risk at that time? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. It's interesting. So my first FTMO account, funded account, I went into drawdown, negative 9%. <laughs> and it's at that time when I designed this risk plan of reducing the risk, Same. right? So it's those circumstances where we find our edge, we refine ourselves, we refine our systems. Uh, so it's, that sounds like what you did. Mm -hmm. So now, first funded account was a 300K. That's, that's, that's amazing. You went into drawdown. Tell me about how you climbed out of that. Well, so... So the first 300K was the one I failed, right? The, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, my Forex okay. Funds one. Yep. At that point, my bank hits zero. <laughs> I had no more money in there. Okay. Then I was like, what can I do now? And I saw the option of overdraft. I can take a 1.5K loan from the bank max. Interesting. So what I did is I bought another 300K with that loan. Man, you, you like to go all in, man. <laughs> I like that. I like that personality. You have that personality. Yeah, So literally, um, I have even pictures of that. I have a video of me recording that that my phone, the bank account, now minus 1.5K. Wow. And I just bought a 300K fund the trader account. Wow. Yep. Now, I know I ask you a lot of questions about your internal thoughts, right? So it sounds like it, it took a lot of faith to do what you're doing. Were you actually thinking of things like that? Like, I know I'm going to make it, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and take this overdraft? <laughs> what were you thinking at the time? I kind of was, and uh, I was very inspired from like uh, other entrepreneurs online as well, right? And how they're always talking about taking risks, and that's when you learn the most. And I, I think around that time, I had also come across Andrew Tate. Okay. okay. So I Top remember G. remember him saying a lot, like when you literally have to roll a six, <laughs> you will roll a six, right? Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm a roll a six now. Okay, man. So you risked it big with your early businesses, lost money. Your first funded account, our first challenge, you lost that money. Uh, it seems like 1,500 pounds at the time being young is probably a lot of money. It's so much. Yeah. My parents would ask me like every week, is your, ma your money still in your account, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's all in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so now the second one that you did, uh, you said you, you went to bank balance zero. Then you took out the overdraft loan with the bank. Tell me about what happened after that. And then that account is the one that I passed. From there, it just went upwards. In the next two months, I managed to get funded 1.2 million. Yep. And then uh, started making so many payouts, it just went fully upward spiral. The loan was fully back to zero and had a lot of payouts. Okay. So what was your first payout? My first payout was my biggest payout. And that was a... 14K the funded trader payouts. Wow, on a 300K account. Yep. And the thing is, um, I had this like uh, plan. I was like, if I'm going to pass one of these challenges and I want to keep trading it, I don't want to make a 1% gain and take the payout because then I am still like, um, I still don't have that much money. Like I still wouldn't have recovered the whole like 5, 6K I had. I was like, I need to build myself a decent buffer where I'm like, okay, even if I feel this challenge now, I still made that 10, 15K yeah. that I still have, then I can use that for other businesses. So literally I, I passed that, my bank is still minus 1.5K, I'm up like 7K, I'm like, I'm gonna keep trading. I keep trading up to like 15K mm. and then take my profit split. Okay, so how how many years into trading are you at this time? Uh, this time, three. 
Three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. 14K withdrawal. That's amazing. Yep. Yeah. So if we go back to the four pillars, so you had your playbook, your system, you use it to pass the challenges and get your first payout. Your risk management seems to be very intact as well. Psychology at this moment, what were your psychological challenges? Because it seems like you were really working through things very well. Like the ability to trade through losses, I think you, seems like you gained that through the demo, right? Trading demo. You were able to like trade demo and then you did like, so you did back testing, forward testing. And that's where you learn that if you can just trade through the losses and you have edge, you'll eventually come out on top, right? Mm -hmm. But what were your psychological challenges? Seems like you were you were just cruising pretty well. <laughs> I, I it has was, to be some things though. Uh, yeah, like uh, uh, that's like a lot of people ask me, right? And I'm like, I actually like, don't understand how people have so many psychological problems uh. because I didn't experience much like crazy problems. I was like, how are you doing this mistake? Like, just don't do it, right? Yeah. Like, how are you revenge trading? Just stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I never understood how people keep doing these things because I didn't really experience it. Not sure why that's the case, but. That's just how I was. Yeah. So what maybe from your childhood or upbringing gives you so much discipline? Because that's what it is. If, you, if, if you're going to revenge trade, it's the discipline not to. Or if you're going to over trade, it's the discipline not to. Right. Um, if you're going to trade outside of your playbook or your plan, it's the ability to control yourself and not to do it. Right. What helped you become a person that had so much discipline? I mean, in order to about yourself. like the trading side, right? It's just about being realistic. Like, you know, if you honestly just take a step back for a second and you're like, if I take that next trade, what's going to happen? Yeah. You know, you know, you're going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it happens over and over. It's like, you just have to stop at one point. It's like, do you want to stay broke? Do you want to get rich, right? It's like, if you want to stay broke, keep making these mistakes because you know the outcome, but you're still making them. Yeah. So what was your worst trade? To be honest, because my system is like I've been sticking to it, sticking to it like so faithfully, right? I've never like deviated from it. So my worst trade is pretty much what I've risked on my stop loss, yeah. which is actually so my risk one percent on a three hundred k is like three k, right? Yeah, and um, that would be my that would be my usual stop loss. But I think at one point I had the stop the trade there, but I forgot there was news coming out. So I got slipped quite badly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So instead of losing like 3K, I lost like 5K. Okay. So that's yeah. probably my worst loss, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the trading style a little bit. Um, are you more technical or fundamental? Uh, technical. Purely technical. Yeah, price no, action. No fundamentals at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then are you, you mentioned the five minute. Is it, is it intraday, like, um, like a move to move type of, or is it more like quick scalps? Um, it's like a move to move. Yeah. Okay. So can you just explain without giving too much away? I know that you're pretty, uh, you're, you're, you guard your edge, your system, right? But can you give us just like, like a high level, 30,000 foot view of your, uh, yeah. of how you form your bias and then how you enter, like what are your like entry yeah. confirmations? So let me explain like the logic behind when, I, when I'm looking at the charts, right? Okay. So the way I trade is very simple, very basic support resistance. On the five minutes, I find my levels of support resistance and uh, what most people would do is, I found out, is let's say um, they're, they're like, okay, this is a support level, price is going to come here. There's two things that can happen. Either price is going to break through that or it's going to bounce from it. So what would the people do? They would either try to sell or buy at the support level. So what I do is, instead of, let's say there's a support, and there's a resistance, instead of placing the order there, I'll place it in the middle somewhere where I believe if price does bounce, it will trigger my order and hit my quick one-to-one -one uh, before it hits resistance. Gotcha. So this way I'm avoiding the whole probability of a not going long, just going down, right? Yep. That, that's like the over, overview of uh, how I'm approaching my okay. trades. And your stop loss and TP are between like five, five minute or 15 minute zones? Uh, they're on the five minute, I'm only on the five minute chart and uh, they're always a fixed amount, 30 points. TP okay. and 30 point stop loss. Gotcha. And their stop orders. Yep. Okay. So your prices hit hit support. If it's if it's going to bounce, it's likely to bounce through your stop yep. and hit your TP. Mm -hmm. Okay. It does always sometimes happen when it hits my entry, but then comes back down to stop loss, right? That's just normal. Yeah, it's going to happen. Over a long, long enough period of time, uh, the way I'm trading, it's uh, profitable. Yeah. One to one, 65%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, question about this. From a high level, 
like so if you're only on the five minute, right? How do you determine when not to trade? So for me personally, I don't trade the news like big red news uh, okay. because those is, is just too volatile and especially because uh, it will uh, the slippage is too big. You just end up losing more than you want to, right? Yeah. That's when I don't trade. And um, that's pretty much the only time I don't trade. Yeah. Because most of the other days, even though I'm averaging two to three trades um, a week, mm-hmm. I'm actually having to place my stop order every day. It's just that most days it just doesn't get triggered. It doesn't because, get triggered. Because uh, as I explained, price might just go the other way and never come back to my order. So that's fine. Yeah. So you've been trading the system for about a year. Um, like I think a year and a half now, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think that there will come a time when you lose edge? So actually uh, about this as well. So when I started, right, I my system, it was pretty much this, but the risk reward was not one to one. It was 0.5. So when I got funded 1.2 million, it was actually by risking 4% to make 2% every trade. But my uh, win rate was like 90%. Okay. So I did that, got funded, but in like four months, I, my win rate went very low because um, let's say I lose one trade, now I need to t- take two wins to recover just one loss, right? At 0.5 risk reward. At that point, I was like, okay, let me see what I can do, right? I went back through my whole, all my trades, all my data. I reviewed all of it. And I was like, okay, let's see if uh, I can improve something there. And uh, <clears throat> and I found out that I can improve the risk to reward to one to one. And that would still keep me profitable and be more consistent. And that's what I did. So what I learned is your edge is very likely that you'll have problems with it in the long term. All you need to be ready is to adapt. You need to be able to review your data and change accordingly because markets change, right? Yeah. So you got to evolve as well as the markets change. Yeah, man, this is incredible. Incredible, man. The reason why I say this is because there are many people out there that ask questions. What should my stop loss be? Where should I put my TP? What should my risk to reward be? But it seems that you actually did your own uh, gate. Uh, you, you did your own research. You came up with the hypothesis and you tried it out. You went through some sort of like scientific method of trying it out, right? And then once you found out that the mark was changing or that you had issues, you did review. <laughs> These are This is what the pros talk about, right? Mm-hmm. So how, how was the review process? Did you use any software or was it all like Excel? Did you pull your data down from MT5? Tell me about that. Uh, so all my trades, I leave them on the chart, right? So well, first thing I did is just go back on the replay mode, check every single trade, and uh, see um, like how they're doing, what can be improved, go over them again and again until you just start seeing patterns like, okay, the 10 trades before, there was like a couple of them that if I did this would have been better, right? Yeah. Then you change that, then you go through the whole data again with this new change yeah. and see how that runs. And then if that's bad, then you go back to the original one, change something else and then review the whole data again. Yeah. And you have to keep repeating that cycle until one of the changes is a actual good change. Man, you're very scientific about this. So you, my friend, are treating this as a business. Yeah. You are. You're treating this as a business. So I'm very proud of you. Thank uh, you. I'm, I'm your elder here. So I'm talking to you as <laughs> as your elder. I'm, I'm very proud of you, man. I'm very proud to hear you, the way that you're doing uh, your business. So now let me ask you about execution. There are many people that have doubt when it's time to pull the trigger, when it's time to press the market order, like put the pending order, the, mm-hmm. the stop. Have you dealt with doubt at all? I did, but that's literally why the stop order removes that. Because when you have market order, the candle's moving up and down. Like you don't know, okay, the candle could be for a second going up. Now you're like, okay, I'm positive. I can buy now. It's a good point to enter. But it starts going down. Now you're like, maybe you can get better entry if I wait a few more seconds, right? It's so many things going through your mind. It's just not a good idea in my opinion, long term. So I was like, screw that, I'm just gonna play a stop order, right? Quite far, like my stop orders are quite far from the price. So I have enough time to place them and everything. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. You place a stop order and you say you leave. Mm-hmm. Do you place any alerts? No, nah, not really. I just come back like the next day or like maybe before bed, I just check it real quick if I can request payout, uh, especially if we're on like on a King's program or something. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Okay. So when did you start doing the, stop orders. So was it during the demo time, during forward testing, or once you 
got funded or during the uh, challenges? Since the demo, like that's when I just, I was like, this is the only way I'm going to trade. I'm not going to do market orders. Market orders are not worth it. Yeah. Okay. And now, so we go back to the review process. Okay. So how long does this normally take you to look into your data? You keep everything on the chart, meaning you keep your markups on the chart in trading view? Only the trades, but then I would have to do the markup again, right? And that way, I don't think it's a bad idea because you're just practicing more. Yep. Because what's the best way to improve at something is by actually doing it more, right? Yeah. Most people think they can just spend an hour and just get better at it. But trading is like a skill like anything else. University takes four years, five years. So why is trading going to take you six months? It's yeah. just not, right? Yeah. So how many hours per day were you spending on the craft? Uh, well, at the start, like I said, like tens of hours, like 10 hours minimum. Mm. I would wake up. The only thing on mind was the, going on the charts. Uh, at one point, I was even excited to do that. Like I would do the charts the whole day. If it was even tiny bit good, that day went on the charts. I would go to bed like, uh, you know, when you, tomorrow, let's say your birthday when you're young and you like have that butterfly feeling in your stomach, that like you're happy, you can't wait for the gifts. I was going to bed like that. I was like, oh, one day when I have this car, big house and everything, this is going to go well. I was excited to go back on the charts next day and um, approach the problem again. Yeah. So we, we talked about your parents' struggle at one point driving you. Now you talked about cars and things you wanted to buy. Did you have sort of like a vision in your mind of your lifestyle that you wanted to live and that drove you as well? Yeah, so I definitely do. Uh, I always want to like have supercars, mansions, all that stuff. The usual stuff everyone wants, right? Yeah. But then uh, realistically, uh, that's like a bit down the line. First, you got like slowly get there, right? There's a lot of many things you have to buy, yeah. like focusing on assets and everything. And then assets will pay for those things. Yeah. Are you reading any books about like business or um, lifestyle money? I never read any book. I actually ended up buying books, but I never read them. Yeah. But you, you, so are you watching any like particular people besides Andrew Tate? Mm, so it was like Andrew Tate, uh, Hamza, Iman Gadzi, these uh -huh. usual entrepreneurs online. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's talk about prop firms a little bit. We talked about your trading style, uh, which I think is what's excellent about it to me is that it's personalized, right? You took the time to develop it. You build a relationship with it. And it seems like you have an intimate relationship with your, your playbook. You worked out execution for yourself, the style that works best for your psychology. Your risk management seems like it's intact. <laughs> the mindset seems like it's intact. Um, seems like you now, when I talk about this, uh, I think about the formula of input versus uh, input times leverage equals output, right? Yep. Seems like you have the input. Now you just need to increase your leverage, more capital. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you're going to scale up if you continue the process, the rules that you have now. So uh, before going into props, let's say your edge starts to, um, you start to have a lower, I'm going to give you like a challenging question now. Because it seems like you're able to work these things out, right? So you say your win rate, your win rate went down. So you modified how you traded your R and R. Mm -hmm. What if it was the if it was different? What if your R and R start, started to go down? What would you? How would you approach like reviewing your data and your system at that point? I mean, that would have been very good because if my R and R went down from zero point five, <laughs> that's too no, bad. No, like as it is now. Oh, so from now, yeah, it's one to one now, average, right? So if it went down to 0.5 again, and you had the same win rate, what would you start to, how would you start to look at your data and look at your system differently? I would have to find a way, like I have to first outline what the main things need to change, right? Because if your RR just goes down, you can't be like, okay, I'm going to try to make my max drawdown better. <laughs> That's a completely different thing. Like you do know what you need to focus on so that you can actually look out for those things on the charts then. Yeah. But in this case, the best solution would probably be try to increase the RR again. Because, or you can increase the win rate, but uh, I don't think I would be able to do that with my system right now. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So one thing that you mentioned is identifying the problems, right? Mm -hmm. So why did you mention that? That's so important. Like even when I start, when I was like on, so even when I finished like doing Amazon, e-com, all these things, right? Uh, about the charts, the first thing that came to my mind was, what is the problem? The problem is, you have literally infinite money in front of you every day on the screen and you need a very, very tiny part of it, like mm -hmm. a very tiny percentage. That's the problem. Yeah. I have to solve it. So if you have a problem, you actually know like, okay, this is what I'm aiming to solve. 
if you have no problem, what are you even doing? Like you're just cluelessly going, right? There you go. Yeah. I think a lot of traders are doing that. Mm -hmm. They are because of the dopamine hit. They're continuing to do the same things over and over and hoping for a different outcome. So let me ask you, there are some people that say you can't make money trading one asset, one symbol, but obviously you've made money trading NAS. What would be your rebuttal if you had one? I think they're stupid. <laughs> 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 like, why do you want to trade so many symbols? I treat every symbol as a different business. Mm -hmm. They're all a completely different thing. Like you might know how to trade one symbol, it won't reflect on the other symbol. Because the way I'm looking at it is, if you're practicing, practicing one symbol, right? You start seeing patterns that only happens on that symbol. Like I see NASDAQ on the New York time, right? Around my, my session, there's always this move that is either up or down, a big move, but then always a retracement happens. And that's when I try to catch the move. There's always this fake out. Most people don't know about this. They can't because they haven't spent that many hours on one symbol. They're trying to learn different symbols. Like if I switch symbols, I just feel like I'm in an unfamiliar environment. Like I feel uncomfortable. I'm like, what is this? It's moving randomly. I have no idea. I'm on the NASDAQ. I'm like, so calm. Like I know how this moves. I know now it's going to start slowing down. It's towards the end of the session, everything. So that's my take on that. Okay. And then you have some that say you can't make money from trading only one time frame. You said you only look at the five minute, no top down analysis. Right. What would be your response to that? I think that it depends on uh, whatever someone likes, right? You got to test different things out. Personally, I didn't like multiple time frames. I like smaller time frames because you have more data and it's easier to, I found it easier to like cherry pick like a certain way of trading on there. Because it's like if you're trading levels, there's so many levels that you can have, you can pretty much guarantee a trade every day that way. On a higher time frame, it's a bit slower. And I feel like I'm, I don't have that much patience where I can wait days or hours for a trade to play out. Right. Um, so now if we move into props specifically, how would you, what's the roadmap to your first payout? How would you advise someone that's watching to, to, to get to their first payout? So first thing I would not advise, like, uh, I went full in on a 300 K every time. Right. I don't think most people that's a good idea. I, you could say that there was definitely a, a, like a degree of luck involved in that. So I don't think everyone can just get lucky all the time, right? So it's definitely a good idea to buy a challenge that you can at least afford three to five times. Okay. This way, psychologically, you have now less uh, uh, pressure. I say this, but then I haven't done it. So I don't know if more pressure is good. Maybe having more pressure is good, right? Because you perform better under high pressure. So it depends on the person, I would say. Yeah. But the the um, um, safer way would be for that, definitely. Yeah. You talk about pressure. Just want to pause here. Do you think that, uh, so you're young, you're pretty young. You didn't have a lot to lose, as you mentioned. There are some people that have jobs, they have kids. Do you think that, was it ever in your mind that you could go back to your parents and get help if you failed? I, I would probably get hit. <laughs> I'll probably get hit. <laughs> You're probably get hit. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I told them I'm down this much money, I blew all that money. For them, that's insane amounts of money. Yeah. Like my mom works like a Tesco's, right? Which is like a superstore. That's nearly like 80% of her annual salary I blew. Mm. So uh, especially because they're Asian parents, right? It's like um, they're very strict about these kind of things. So Yeah. So that So you couldn't go back to them. So that was that a factor that was driving you as well? to be successful with trading? I mean, I was scared, but you're scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you're scared when you're young, right? If you get bad grades, you're gonna get hit. So what do you do? You get good grades. Yeah. So that's why I did it. <laughs> ah, so it's the circumstances that pushed you. Kind of, yeah. Kind of, that yeah. definitely helps. And your own determination. Okay. All right, so talked about pressure. Three to five times, you, you can afford the account three to five times. So what, what going back to the roadmap. So you said, okay, or buy an account that you can afford three to five times, what's next? Then before you actually, this is like to actually buy an account, right? But before there's a lot more things, Okay. which is actually having an edge, yeah. a system. If you don't have a system, you don't need to worry about buying an account. Yeah. So for the system, what I recommend is you need a minimum of six months of uh, back testing data and three months of forward testing data. The back testing data must be either minimum six months. Uh, it has to be minimum six months with a hundred trades. So if you get 
50 trades in six months, do it for 12 months, but get 100 trades. So both of these uh, need to be met, six months and 100 trades. Okay. Once you have that, then you go into a three month follow test. That's when you will actually see if uh, what you back tested is consistent. If that's the case, then now you got get, um, now you go get a challenge and you try it there. Okay, six months back testing, three months forward testing. Mm -hmm. All right, get the challenge. Risk one percent. What's the risk recommendation? Uh, one percent is what I would safely recommend, but obviously it depends on your uh, system that you've been testing. Because maybe you got super lucky, you've been testing some seven uh, RR system, right, and it's been doing well. But if it's a seven RR, your max drawdown is hundred percent going to be big. There's no way you would survive the one percent risk. So then you have to according like uh, change your risk according to that, according okay. to your max drawdown. Okay. Because that's literally what determines if you want to blow the account or not, right? Yeah. Okay. So how many times did you sit down and write these variables out? Because what I'm hearing is you're playing with variables, mm -hmm. playing with numbers, right? Sort of like a scientist, as I mentioned. You're very scientific um, about this. How many times did you sit maybe on your whiteboard, on your paper, and write these variables down and entertain interchange numbers? <laughs> Probably hundreds. I was doing it every day, right? This yeah. Is, this is literally what I was trying to do. I was yeah. trying to play with numbers until I solved the problem. Yeah. Man, amazing. Amazing. Okay, so now once they get to the funded stage, what's your recommendation to get the first payout? Uh, so my recommendation is make any percent gain. If you win your first trade, stop right there. Wait for the payout. Take the money. Take your refund. Buy a new challenge the refund and keep now trading the account risk-free. But always stop at one uh, payout, like one um, win. That's what I'm doing to this day. I win once, even if I have to wait 14 days, I just take that payout because that's money that you have left there. Yeah. So why would you want to like try to win two in a row now and risk losing the already big amount of money that could be there? So when did you start trading like that? Because I, you mentioned your first payout, you went up to like- After my first payout. 5%. Okay, right after that. It was all planned. That. My first payout, I needed to be big to build a buffer. And I risked it. I just kept stacking wins, loss win. And then as soon as I was done, I was like, that's it. Now every win, I'll take the payout. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in your playbook, do you have multiple setups or just one? It's pretty much one. It's like one for show, one for buy, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's It's the same it. one that you mm -hmm. just, you've mastered yeah. pretty much. And it's pretty you much the A plus refine setup. Refine it. That's your A plus setup. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Excellent. So you don't have any C's. You don't have any like. <laughs> no uh, point taking those, right? There you go. I like it. I like it. Okay. Now, for you, what's next when it comes to props? Mm, so currently I am funded 1.3 million. Okay. So maybe I will try to get to 2 million. I am also focusing on the education side, helping other people uh, get to what I've done right. Because I do have like the credibility. They can yeah. see my dashboard. I've literally never blown an account. Yeah. And it says like 500 days on my dashboard. So people, if they want to replicate that, I can help them. That's kind of my goal. And um, just skill, social media, YouTube, all these things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think I heard you mentioned you wanted to get up to 5 million in one of your uh, interviews. So is that like a next year goal? Uh, yeah, that's definitely one of my goals. I will, the problem with that is, right, uh, it's very hard to get there with the trustworthy firms. Like yeah. you can get maybe up to 2 million with the, uh, all the good firms, but then to get to 5 million, now you're going into firms that might reject payouts if you make actually good money with them. So do you want to risk that? This depends. Yeah. Did you do any scaling with any of the firms? The only one I had ever scaled was uh, the uh, my Forex funds. I had 700K with them, mm. which I lost. Yeah. How did that impact you, man? I didn't care. I was like, I, as soon as I saw that, I, was, I bought 1 million challenges and just started running them. Yeah. I was like, I lost this. There's no point crying about it. It's not going to come back, right? Yeah. So I'll move on. Yeah. Okay. And so now you say you moved to 2% risk on the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, do you find any challenges or problems doing this? Have you found run into any problems doing that? Not really, because I do already have quite a big amount I'm trading to make profits, right? Yeah. So 2%, even if I do worst case lose it, it won't be that bad. Okay. So it's not that big of a deal, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so to this day, like how many in total payouts do you have? Like more than 45. Wow, 45 payouts. <laughs> like in monetary wise, how much like maybe around? Nearly 200K now. Nearly 200K, man. Congratulations, man. Thank That's you. amazing. Amazing. 20 years old, 200K, still in uni. Amazing. Amazing. All right. So now we're going to talk about some questions for the audience a little bit. Okay. So I have three traders that I think are watching. Number one, you have the struggling trader. They've been trading 
maybe a year or two, maybe even three, but struggling. They haven't made any money, just putting money in. What would be your advice to them? I mean, if they spend so many years, right, trading, they're definitely doing something wrong. Mm. They just have to understand what they're doing wrong. Because there's no way you can be doing something wrong for so many years. I see so many people that I, oh, I've been trading for 10 years, but I'm still not profitable. It just doesn't make sense to me. Like, how? Mm -hmm. how, you, how are you so bad? <laughs> yeah. like, they like staying broke then, right? That's the only conclusion. Yeah. Like, how are you not making it happen? It's not, at the end of the day, it's not that difficult if you think about it, right? It's all about thinking about it clearly, having, going into it with intention and, good, and the plan. That's what you have to do. So what would you tell them to actually look at specifically related There's a lot to trading? Of things, right? But doing it like probabilistically is probably the best way. Like actually start writing down numbers and try to understand it from a number numbers point of view instead of just blindly being like, oh, I'm some next level hedge fund analyst. I see a trend line. I see this, this. Now I'm going to try to take this trade with this stop loss and I want to aim for this whole big move, right? Now you're just trying to do this whole flashy stuff uh, that you might see online that you're predicting the markets. Like It looks cool, but that's not how you're going to make money. The, the people that make money is a boring way, like small, like big stop loss, decent risk to reward, 1.5, 1, and they just do it for long enough where they actually make money. And I would say the actual life, their life, around, like trading is just a small part of life. Uh, I've said this before as well in one of the interviews, like the way I look at it is it's an equation. If you are losing in every other aspect of life, you add trading to that, you're probably going to lose at that as well, right? Yeah. If you're winning in all other areas, add trading to it, you're most likely going to win. You go to the gym, you have a good diet, that's already building discipline and everything for you, right? You already have the ability to research when, you, when you're going on a good diet, right? You have to do so much research, okay, what should I eat and everything. So now all these things carry you over to a skill you're trying to learn yeah. because you already have these characteristics. Yeah. So I heard you say that you wanted to hold on to your account forever in one of the interviews. As a goal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as a goal. And you're doing a great job so far. So have you ever been tempted to take the other route? You know, some people, they've learned the game of being able to churn accounts. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been tempted to take that route? The thing is, the way I looked at trading, right, is actually a professional approach. Yeah. I'm trading like it's supposed to be done. They're actually trading. Yeah. Not... Uh, finding an edge in the prof firm system yeah. where I can make money with just these accounts. Like you could put me on a personal account, I would still be fine. There you go. Like I'm soon going to start like a 100K personal account and just compound that. Yeah, that's good. I think a lot of people that they go the other route, they've just found edge in the mm -hmm. prop firm way. They're going to have problems once they go to their personal. Definitely. They've been, they're not going to realize it because you can't just reset when you have live funds. I think that a lot of people, they, they get into the habit, that cycle of resetting. Yeah. Uh, but the way that you're taking them um, is, is very honorable uh, as well. So you may see some guys speed past you in payouts, but when it comes to the live trading, when you get to that point, you'll be able to compound a lot faster. Definitely. Yeah. Because like, if you think about it, these guys are making so many more payouts, right? Or bigger payouts. And if you um, do like a whole calculation of every single uh, challenge they bought and all the payouts, they're probably making the same amount, I would say, right? They're probably, probably break now. even or they're even negative, some of them. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's an important point. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the second trader, he is getting some payouts but blowing the accounts, right? He's in this cycle. Uh, what would be your advice to him? He probably needs to review the data, right? Because if he's blowing accounts, either he could have a bad risk management. It, it could be a bunch of things, right? It could be bad risk management, it could be psychology that maybe he takes a payout, then he's trying to make a more bigger payout. So many variables that could be going wrong there. Yeah. So I would say just keep trying. Just I keep really trying, don't know yeah. what to tell this trader, right? Yeah. Okay. And then the third trader, they have consistency on smaller accounts. They want to scale up. What would be your recommendation for them? Save up, buy a bigger account and do the same thing. Because if you can do a smaller account, you can do on a bigger account. Yeah. It, it's like, I don't know how people are like, I can't deal with a bigger size. Well, what's scary? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the same, you're doing the same thing. Why are you scared there's a bigger number there? Yeah. It's just a number on a screen. You lose that count, you turn your head, you're still alive. You're still in your room. Yeah. You're still fine. Life still goes around. Yeah. Nothing changed. Yeah. Right? So why are you scared of a random number on a screen? Yeah. So I feel this detachment from the money mm -hmm. when, it come, when I talk to you. Where do you think that comes from? It's just that I've been focusing on, I focus on the actual like, skill, right? 
if you focus on the skill, I, I can lose all my money I made so far today. I won't care. Yeah. I'll be like, it would suck, right? I'll be best sad. I'll be like, okay, whatever. Now I'm gonna go again. I'm gonna make it even better. It's like motivation. I wanna be, I'll be like so much more driven. I'll be like, watch me now. I wanna make so much more than that. And I wanna go at it again and make more. But there's, then there's people that will literally just cry and go become depressed about that, right? They're like, oh, I lost so much money. I'm depressed now. Go to therapy or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> go to therapy or something. Uh, okay. So, uh, very good. Very good. So did you face any psychological challenges when you were scaling up at all? Seeing big numbers? I mean, the only challenge I might have faced a little bit is like, uh, even if, even though I made so much money right now, right? I'm still like a bit, um, I have second uh, thoughts about buying a new challenge. I'm like, oh, what if I lose this? It's going to be like 1.5 is gone, right? Um, then I'm like, just do it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm always a bit scared now to buy a new challenge because I don't know, maybe I'm a bit happy with that. I already have so much big funding, right? Yeah. So buying a new one, I'm like, do I really need it? Yeah. But it's always good to scale up. Yeah. So you don't like taking challenges? <laughs> Not that much. Yeah. <laughs> Me neither. I don't think anybody <laughs> likes it. Uh, okay. So do you find the funded stage to be easier than the challenge stage? Now, I think they're the same. The unlimited time, there's no difference, right? I don't know people, like right now, I heard the pro firms, uh, the, the statistic didn't change much from before. Like the pass rate and the loss rate is pretty much the same, which to me makes no sense, right? Yeah. Like back then, passing a challenge is insanely hard. Making the 80% in one month is like next level. Yeah. Like you would, it's unheard of that good traders can do that, right, in a month. But now you can take six months, there's no problem. Just take it slowly. Yeah, I think, I think it goes back to what the professionals say, like, um, it's not our focus to make money. It's our focus to play out our process, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I hear you saying. Mm -hmm. It's about the skill. You foc you've always focused on the skill. But I think a lot of the people, they're just focusing on the money, yeah. even without the unlimited days. When you have the skill, you can just slow grind, slowly exactly. trade your account, and eventually you pass phase one, phase two, and get to the payout. Okay, that, that makes sense. So question for you. So you, you've dealt with FTMO, my Forex funds, the funded trader, how would you recommend traders um, find out who they would like to uh, um, do business with? Like what funded accounts or what funded companies they should do business with? Uh, I mean, you should probably just check the top ones to be fair, right? So the top ones are FTMO, uh, the funded trader. What's the third one? <laughs> um, yeah, my Forex ones is out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was first before. Yeah. Um, yeah, but FTMO and the funditor is good enough for most people. Yeah. Like 99% of people watching this are probably not going to have se seven figures in funding anyways. So just choose one of these two. Funditor is really good. FTMO is really good. Pick one, go over there and keep trying. Yeah. Do you have any worries about the U.S. firms now that my Forex funds went down? Um, I don't have any like major worries, right? What's the worst? If it goes away, then just try to go for firms that are in a different maybe um, country, right? If, if all firms go away, then I'll just figure something else out. <laughs> you figure something else out. So are you banking up your, are you saving up money for your personal just in case? Yeah. So the rule I follow is every payout is 80-20. 80% 20. 80 of the payout gets saved up. 20% of what I'm using for just normal spending, right? But because recently the payouts have been so many, I'm increasing that percentage. So now I'm like 95-5. Only 5% wow. goes to my bank for like normal spending. 95 saved up. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Why did you start that? Because the goal is uh, to buy things that will make you money, right? Like real estate is one of them. So that's one of my goals, to buy real estate. Um, I need a lot of money for that. Yeah. And that's why I'm saving up a lot of money. So eventually I can buy one house, two house, compound them as well. Yeah. Obviously that's not the easy way. It's not the best way to get like filthy rich, but it's a good uh, start to it's it. It's a good start, especially mm -hmm. at 20 years old. Yeah, so you're starting really early. So now that you're profitable with one system, are you focusing more on just scaling your uh, capital or are you going to develop more systems, different models? I'm gonna stick with one system, keep uh, optimizing this if need, need be right, and increase my capital, make as many payouts as I can, and keep the going. That's the okay. current goal, yeah. So you're not really looking like, you don't get tempted to look into other communities and other I, I do sometimes, like for example, ICT, right? It, it seems like this 
um, shiny thing. That's what's that called? The the shiny object syndrome, right? Yeah. So you just gotta be careful of that. You just want to know that's a thing. Yeah. So I'm just like. If I see, if I get this feeling, I should look into it. I'm like, no, that's shiny of the syndrome. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You seem quite disciplined. I, I, that's a reoccurring theme. And that's what I believe helps you become, um, remain uh, successful when it comes to trading. Yeah. Discipline, consistency, the key in everything, I would say. Yeah. Like you want to make progress in absolutely anything. Stay disciplined and stay consistent, and eventually the progress will happen, right? Yeah. So l let's talk about maybe like five traits that you've identified that have made you successful. So discipline is one, right? What are maybe other four, four other things that have helped you be consistently profitable? So you gotta be observant about everything, right? You gotta understand what's going on around you. You can't just be blind <laughs> yeah. and just do what you like see on one video or hear someone do it. And you're like, oh, I want to do this just because someone said it. You got to actually like understand, like, I don't, I don't know how to word it, but yeah, you no, know what I'm saying. The observation is a, a, a theme that we've heard throughout this interview. You observing the numbers. You said you wrote these numbers down hundreds of times. You've observed your trades. You back tested data. Um, I think a lot of people that I've talked to, they don't go deep enough when it comes to observation. Okay. So discipline, observation. What's, a, what's another one? Hmm. Could say obsessive, obsessive with the actual outcome. It's like I'm not gonna, I'm not satisfied until I don't get the outcome I'm looking for. Mm. I, I feel like so far, everything I've put my mind mind to, I'm like, I, I want, this is what I'm gonna get. I've got it. Mm. It might take time. So let's say when I was a kid, right? I wanted, let's say, a toy or something. Somehow I managed to get that. Yeah. Like maybe I had to do hard work, get good grades, convince my parents. Somehow I always got what I wanted. But then suddenly when I was like, I want this huge thing, which is like success, let's say. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting it, but it's because the um, thing is so big, it takes longer. It takes longer. It yeah. takes more work. Mm -hmm. But being able to maintain the obsession mm -hmm. is actually a skill, Yeah, I believe. Like you can't get rich just because you want to make an extra 500 with your nine to five job. You're not gonna get rich. Yeah, that, that's not obsession to actually becoming uh, wealthy. Like, I want to build generational wealth, right? Yeah. People, there's so many people that are like, oh, what's a side hustle I can do just to make an extra 500, 200 with my job that will help me with this car payment, my fuel. I'm like, these people are just stupid. <laughs> mm. So Grant Cardone, he talks about in the 10x rule, 10xing your goals and obsessing over them. Mm -hmm. So it seems like Armand has a huge, massive vision. You're not telling anybody because it seems like you're a mad scientist <laughs> that keeps things closely, right? But reveal a little bit to me because you talked about generational wealth. Yeah. And it seems like that's, you have that vision, right? So when you think about Armand 10 years from now, 15 years from now, what do you see? So, so to be honest, when I actually started the entrepreneurship journey, right? So when I was speaking to my friends about and everything, that I wanna make this much money, right? That, like literally since day one, the goal I told everyone was, I want to make 500K a month. That's mm. my goal. I, I've never changed that, 500K a month. I'm, I'm not close to it right now, but um, I'm making progress because the goal is so big, right? All yeah. these things are just happening on the way there. Yeah. How are you maintaining the obsession? 500K, like I shared a, a big goal with my family and they're like, how in the world are you going to do that? <laughs> just like you, right? But how do you maintain the focus on that um, that goal? I'm not sure how you just do it, right? Yeah, it's like, just, I it need just 500k a month. Until you need I don't 500k. Have it, I'm not gonna be happy. Why do you need 500? I feel like it's a good number where I can buy pretty much anything I want. I can literally buy a house every month at that point. <laughs> <laughs> man, that's amazing, man. Okay, discipline, observation, obsession. Two more. I think you gotta believe in God, the belief in God. Mm. That's one of the very important ones. I don't talk about it a lot, but uh, it's something I've been like following a lot. It, but I don't tell everyone I oh, follow God, right? And stuff. Well, like, I don't like talking about it, but. Thanks for mentioning it here uh, on my podcast, because this is something that's important to me. It's very important. And I believe that it it's helped me overcome massive obstacles, right? So talk to me a little bit more about why that's important for you, the so, belief in God. So the way I look at it is uh, literally 24-7, God's watching you, right? He's watching what you're doing. So now you have to 
shape your life, your actions daily uh, around that? Are you going to do something that will disappoint God? Mm. Like the way I, I'm literally sitting here right now, though, in my mind, up there somewhere, there is God and there's all my ancestors in like in a courtroom. And I'm like uh, the case and just watching my life as it unfolds, right? And they're like uh, the jury, you could say, they're going to make decisions of, uh, if, oh, he did this bad. Then that's a punishment. That's the lesson he's to learn there, right? So that's why I'm looking at it. So just go out. Um, because if you go around life like that, you mostly do the right things, right? Who instilled this in you? Or how was this instilled in you? It, it just happened. Like my mom's very religious and she always like tried to force the religion on, on me, right? And uh, I, I've always said like, oh no, I don't follow God and stuff like that. But internally I've always been like, uh, uh, God's real, right? Like, especially when you're like, let's say in a bad period of time and you think about God, you just feel comforting, right? Yeah. So it must be real. Yeah. So just thinking about something makes you comforting. That's quite cool. Like, yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, believing people think that take the perspective that God puts you in these situations that are of difficult difficulty, so mm -hmm. that you can turn to Him, yeah. right? So, at what point in your life did you uh, did this belief become stronger? Because when you're a child, you're groomed with religion, you're groomed yeah. with traditions. But then there's a certain point when you actual actually become conscious uh, of it, of the belief in God, and your connection grows, right? So, at, how did this happen for you? I would say probably like um, halfway through of the time I was just failing at everything, right? Because um, I was like, because when you're at that point, right, you're actually like quite sad, like you just keep failing because you want to become rich. Yeah. You don't even know that I'm gonna make money like a year later down the line. In your mind, you could be making just losses forever. So um, that's what I was like, okay, these are all tests, right? God just testing you and you got past the test. And the main goal is you learn from it. So every time something hard happens, I always, something hard or bad, I always try to find the lesson in there. Mm. Because I feel like there's a lesson. Yeah. If you don't learn the lesson, you're probably going to find the same thing happen to you again. Man, this is amazing. We're getting deep here. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a tradition in my religious faith that says, the believer doesn't step in the same snake hole twice, right? So what you're saying about reflecting. Now, let's. how does this translate to success in trading, the belief in God? How does it help you? You know something, this is crazy, by the way, uh, I have a name uh, uh, for my system. I call it the God system. Mm. It's powered by God. So the way I look at it is because trading is so random, it's just probabilities, I cannot control the outcome. So I'm like, God's controlling the outcome. And how's that outcome gonna be controlled by my actions? If I do something bad today, I feel like I wanna lose that trade today because God's gonna be changing that trade to a loss. So every day I'm doing the right things as much as I can to then impact my trades to be winning trades because that's a God's powered system. This is powerful, <laughs> man. This is powerful. Man, I almost, I'm almost in tears, bro. <laughs> For real. <laughs> so, I subscribe to SMB Capital, Mike and Bella Fury. I read, I read, I've read a lot of books, and one of the things that he says is our focus is not on money; it's on doing the right thing, and that's what you just verbalized. Yep. Right. Being so young, this is very inspirational. Now, that's four things. I'm just going to repeat them because they're very powerful: discipline, observation, obsession, faith in God. Give me one more. Mm, I guess perseverance. 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 Talk to me about that. You just got to keep, keep going, right? You can't give up. Like there's no other option. Because if you, that, the way I look at it is the only way you want to lose is if you quit. If you don't quit, you can't lose. It's impossible, right? Like, okay, you might learn a lesson. You might take some losses. You keep going forever. You can keep going forever. But as soon as you quit, it's over. That's yeah. when you've admitted defeat. That's when you have lost. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk about obsession and the faith of, and faith in God for a minute. So how do you, when some people hear obsession, they think that whatever you're focusing on has higher priority than God. When you say obsession, what do you mean? And how, is that, how does that relate to the faith, uh, the belief in God? I mean, my obsession, let's say my obsession is with making like 500K a month, right? 
um, God's going to help me make that. <laughs> so I, I don't see those two things like contrasting. My man. They go hand in hand, right? My man. This is what I'm talking about, right? So now, why do you believe God wants you to have so much success? I think God doesn't want you to have success. You are going to have to do things so that God will give you success, right? So that's why I am going with that frame of mind where I'm doing everything correctly, um, doing everything right. So then God will reward you. Mm. If you're doing things wrong, you're not going to get rewarded, right? Then you're punished by God. Like, you're just not going to get stuff. That's why you can see a lot of them very successful people, right? They do follow God. It's very rare you would see someone very successful and be a good person and be like uh, an atheist. Okay. It's very rare. Okay. So in the science of getting rich, it talks about how two things, thinking in the right way, which it sounds like you're thinking in the right way. You say, I need 500K. And I asked why. He said, I mean, that's just, that's my number, right? And then you said that you are going to, and the second thing is doing things in the right way to get there, right? So you can have two people, two traders in, in the UK. They can live next door to each other. And these two traders, one can be thinking in the right way and doing things in the right way. And the other could be thinking in the wrong way and doing in the wrong, doing things in the wrong way. Same background, same location, same trade, uh, same symbol, but it's those two factors that would make one successful uh, yeah. and the other not. They're looking at the same market. Yeah, they can literally both make it to 500K a month, I would say. But let's say one is like a scammer, right? Like at the end of the day, you know you're scamming people. Yeah, and you know, if, if you have the same like frame of mind where you're like, God's watching you, how are you going through your day knowing that you scam people, God's watching you? It's just... How? <laughs> it's going to be very hard. Yeah. You probably will eventually lose that money just because uh, if you make if you make so much money in a bad way and then you realize about God, I think you will probably lose it. So, man, this has been a really good uh, interview so far. <laughs> so let's talk about, so we have those five traits, right? Just going to repeat them one more time because they're, they're so <laughs> powerful. Uh, discipline, observation, oh. obsession, the faith in God, and perseverance. Okay. Now, let's move to your uh, YouTube, right? So you just recently started YouTube. Can you explain a little bit why, a little bit about why you did? Yeah, so I started YouTube because I understood the power of like social media, right? It's yeah. like, um, so to be honest, like um, you need more source of income as well. And uh, YouTube would be one of them as there's like uh, monetization and it helps with um, growing a big audience. And then you can help the audience by selling them um, a useful service, like an actual valuable product. Yeah. A good example of that would be like Umar Ashraf. He has uh, the Tradezilla software. Uh, that's a very good software that's helping a lot of people. But if he wasn't on YouTube, he wasn't big, he would not be able to pitch that product to so many people. Yeah. And he wouldn't be as successful and helping that many people. Yeah. So that's like one of the reasons, yeah. Okay. So for those that say successful traders don't offer education, what would be your response to them? I mean, it depends how successful they are, right? Are they making like 10 million a year? <laughs> then sure, they might not. But even then, I don't see why. Because the more you make with trading, now the more validity your like results have and uh, the more uh, sales you can have, like more value you can provide. So it's all, so if someone's making 10 million and he starts an education, he'll probably make millions from education. Someone's making 100K, he'll probably make tens of thousands from education. So they go hand in hand. In hand. So the ratio is always going to be very high where the trader is going to be motivated to start an education. Yeah. And then it depends on the trader if they're going to do it faithfully, right? Scam the audience, sell them some garbage, course, like, um, yeah, just random thing. Or they're actually going to provide value, which again, will take work. Yeah, because it takes work to make something that will provide value. Yeah, so you mentioned scammers. Can you give the audience some advice about how to avoid scammers? So obviously you've reached a certain level of success. You have credibility with your payout certificates. But not only that, I think that you can sort of <laughs> smell some BS, <laughs> right? You reach a certain point, you can kind of like sniff out yeah. some uh, who's a scammer, who's not, right? What's the recommendation to the audience of how like they should avoid scamming or uh, scammers or how they should pick a mentor? So the common theme among these guys is they're young and... Uh, they say they trade, 
but the money they have is insane. They have like tens of millions from trading and they haven't even shown a single piece of result that is like, oh, look at this. This is how I made 10 million. This is my FX book. No one's done it. Mm -hmm. So if there's no proof, then don't go for it. Yeah. Like if I'm going to ever sell something, right? I do have an ed education, which I just launched like a month ago. Mm -hmm. On there, I'm just giving my ex exact same trades to people. And I'm only charging like, uh, it was 50 when I was like 150 a month, right? That's because the value, yeah. they can have the same results as me. With that, it's not a ma like a lot of people can learn, obviously, because it's just my trades. But eventually I will start teaching them like how I'm actually doing it, right? Yeah. So like uh, actually seeing the evidence that these people are actually providing results, right? So like I'm showing actual results, like, you know, Darwin X uh, zero, right? So like I was like 23rd or something last month on it. So that's an FCA regulated actual platform. Mm -hmm. So if you see my trades are there and I'm sending the same trade, it's real. So you need that proof. If someone's not providing proof, just don't go with them. Yeah, okay, sounds good. So do you have big goals for your YouTube? Just interest, I'm just interested in, in that. Well, hopefully my goal would be like 100K in 2024 subscribers, right? You can do it. Oh, hopefully. Oh, obviously like subscribers, that's just like a numbers goal. It's not really like the correct way of approaching it because uh, views matter more than subscribers, right? There's a lot of channels that have smaller subscribers, but they have insane views because views is what actually is like people's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. So you have uh, your YouTube, you have your socials. I've seen reels coming out. Um, you have the education that's that you're providing. Um, what's a longer game for you, like longer term uh, my, goals? My main, main goal next year is to be able to buy my parents a house. Beautiful. Uh, fully for my money, I can pay for it, everything. Uh, that's my main goal. Beautiful. 21 years old, you buy your parents a house. That is, that's a great... That'd be crazy. That'd, that'd be, be a very crazy. good video as well. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Man, that, that'll be great. Um, all right. So last question. It's a fun question. If we could fast forward 10 years and you're talking to Armand that's 30, what does Armand of 30 tell the 20 year old, 20 year old Armand? So far it would be just keep doing the same thing, right? Because it seems to be working. So why change something that's working, right? Now that you are uh, more known in the, in the trading space, do you look up to anybody out there? Omar Hashraf has to be like the top trader I look up to in the online space, right? It's like the numbers are doing crazy. You see his YouTube, like his document, like six years ago, like you see his progress and everything. It's, it's really inspirational. Then there's other good traders like Paladin as well, right? He's doing really well, very motivational on his YouTube growth. Your YouTube growth is really motivational as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. All right. Um, do you, are there any traders that you really kind of hang out with? Or are you like mainly to yourself? Um, I mean, here, mainly to myself, but then there's like, I do know most of the traders in the space, right? So whenever, whoever's like close by, we do like meets and everything like that. Okay. Do you think it's important for traders to have community that they're a part of? It definitely helps. So like, if you know other traders that are actually genuinely doing well and you hang around with them, it's just a completely different like um, um, circle. Like when I hang out with traders, and I hang out with my like old friends, it's just two completely different things. It, you just feel inspired the whole time when you hear other traders like crushing it, right? Yeah. You hear the new business, the new idea. You're like, damn, that's crazy. Like I want to never level up more, right? Yeah. You hang out with your old friends, it's the usual stuff, right? You're just like, oh, just time pass. <laughs> so tell me about one of your most exciting trades. You seem very, uh, you seem very balanced with, with your emotions. like. I lose, eh, I win, eh. But tell me about like an exciting time, even if you didn't express it, but internally you were like, man, this is, I, I've made it. Or um, all of the hard work has paid off. I actually never felt that. <laughs> it, it's like with trading, it's, it can be all gone the next day, right? So until maybe I don't hit the 500K, I won't be able to say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you've escaped this, uh, the feeling of euphoria. Like you, you, Yeah, I don't really feel that. Wow, it's amazing. Like I literally be my um, win streak recently. November, I got nine wins in a row. Mm. And on uh, King's program, I took a payout every single day of 1%. So that was a big month, right? But I was just over it like the next day. Yeah. So like almost like 27K. Yeah. Like it was like close to a 40K month. <sighs> Beautiful. <laughs> it's, Beautiful. It's a big number, but then you're like 40K. What can you actually get with that? Like 
sure, it's 40K, add it to the whole stack of money, keep stacking. It's, it's not keep that stacking. much. Yeah. Yeah. Until you reach this 500K a month goal, everything else is a stepping stone. That's yeah. what it sounds like. I might go crazy 500K though. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, tell, so when you make your first 500K month, what are you going to do? Honestly, probably nothing. But once I make it like a few months in a row, uh, I'll just start spending like crazy, you know? What are you, you going to buy? <laughs> Supercars, <laughs> everything. <laughs> Shopping sprees, my family, everyone, you know? You just, because at that point you just spend, you have so much money. You have, you can buy a house, cars. You're never going to be poor at that point. What, what supercar are you looking at? To be honest, I'm not like a big nerd about cars, right? I like all the super fast ones, like anything, Lambos, McLarens, Ferrari. They're all good. Yeah. So hopefully I can have one of each. Uh, okay. <laughs> so ten, <laughs> so one of each. I, I, I love this uh, this type of thinking, man. So I believe that you'll be very successful if you continue this path. Hopefully. <laughs> Lastly, um, where can people find you? Like uh, Twitter? What, what do you? Yeah, they can find my Twitter, my YouTube, Instagram. Usual things, you know. Yeah. Instagram's Armand.S.S.A. YouTube and Twitter's Armand Trades. Okay. Any last message for the audience, just the traders out there? Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. Don't give up. Simple advice. Yep. All right. 20 years old. Uh, you have a great success right now. You're going to graduate, uh, God willing. Continue this path. You'll be successful. Thanks for joining this podcast, man. This is one of my uh, favorite as Thank well. Thank you for having me, bro. I really appreciate you, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, bro.